Good evening. Good to see you tonight. So that was my wife that just left. She came for the worship because she heard this Thursday. So uh, anyways, good to see you guys tonight as we continue to walk through Ephesians. And literally walking is what we're doing uh, we looked at uh, actually Ephesians 5, 1 through 20, and it's like this little mini-series where we talk about Ephesians uh, 5, 1 through 7, walking in love, verses 8 through 14, walking in light, and then we'll kind of wrap up this little mini-thing uh, with Ephesians 5, 13 through 21, walking in wisdom. When we went through Ephesians uh, 5, 1 through 7, walk in love last week, again, a primary themes were this. Uh, number one, at the very beginning, being an imitator and follower of God. And, um, and really what that means is what? Keeping stride with the fa- Savior and becoming more like him every day. <laughs> okay, it's getting interesting over there. <laughs> now that door always needs should be shut anyway. So anyway, so being an imitator and follower of God and, uh, you know, keeping stride with the Savior and becoming more like him and then walking in love, which is, by the way, what walk in love. And then this is the, I think, of all the verses, this is the one that struck me the most is when we went through the scripture last week, that the sacrifice of Jesus was a sweet smelling aroma to God. And, and, and it's almost befuddling that that would be true, that literally the death of his son would be a sweet aroma. But why was that the case? Because all the sacrifices of God were always meant to do what atone for sin, right? And this was the final sacrifice. He died once for all. This to smelling aroma of all. Never again, never again will there be a sacrifice for sin because Jesus paid the price once for all. And then we're to continue to put away the old man because it is not fitting. It don't fit. It's not who we are. It's all about identity. It's not about so much struggling in the flesh, doing the right thing or the wrong thing. While those are true, it's just not who we are anymore. We have a new identity in Christ. And therefore, now we continue to put on the new man to clothe ourselves in Christ because it is fitting. We are. It fits. And then... The unbeliever, and this, this is, it will always come down to this, and, and it's not a struggle. It's not even inherently a hard teaching or difficult teaching, because whatever is the word is the word, and you teach that, and you teach that truth. But this truth is the unbeliever will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that is tragic. No matter how we look at it, that is tragic, right? And, you know, the reason that they will not inherit this kingdom because they have not chosen this kingdom. Because they are not inheriting the kingdom of God, the wrath of God will be poured out upon them. The wrath of God will be poured out upon them. The unbeliever is literally, literally the object of God's wrath. Man, that, that's, a, that's tough. That's tough. And then for us, do not listen to there the world's the unbeliever is what empty words or be partakers with them because what does light have to do with darkness? Absolutely nothing, right? And what meaningless out of Ecclesiastes, any advice the world has to give us, anything they have to say to us, it's meaningless. It has no eternal value, no eternal value whatsoever. So before we jump into the uh, scriptures, we could have some readers. Donna, <laughs> thank you very much. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Carol, give me uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 7. Judy, I always like giving you scriptures because I don't know what translation you're going to throw at me. Just kidding. So let's go 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 14 through 18. Any other victims out there? Any other readers? All right, Patty. Let's get you... uh, Oh, this is a good one. Psalm 10, 17 and 18. Psalm 10, 17 and 18. I'm not supposed to ask Steve because he can't do two things at once. <laughs> Just kidding. Any other readers? Yeah, of course, Ray. Come on, Ray. John 6, 7 through 11. John 6, 7 through 11. 
Is that it? Anybody else? I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I like reading a lot of scripture. You're going to come to a study I'm teaching, you're going to read a lot of scripture. So. <clears throat> because scripture is the best commentary of scripture. So, Lord, bless your word, and here's our scripture for this evening. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. And Christ, and Christ will give you light. So walk in the light. Verse 8, for once, for you once were dark. Walk as children of light. For once you were darkness. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, that would be done. how this scripture totally lines up with just what we reviewed, that we what? We're by nature children of wrath. By nature, that's who we are. Sinners and nothing else. No alive to God. Dead, completely dead to God. And, and remember, though, the operative word in all of this is once. We once were. We are that no longer, and consider it not. I mean, seriously, consider it not. That is not who you are anymore, right? But now you're light in the Lord. And remember that light, light, God and God alone, James 1.17. For every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Light and the life of men come from God and God alone. I love this verse, by the way, because it tells us who God is totally unchanging. There's no variation for God. We don't have to guess about God. We don't have to guess. There is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. We don't have to guess about him. So we're to walk as children of light. Who had First John 5 through 7? that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin if we say that we have no sin that's okay i the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin but really, the, the theme here is what God is light and in him. There is no darkness at all. And we're to walk in the light as he is in the light. And we have fellowship with one another. By the way, that's tonight. That is tonight. We are having fellowship with one another. And the light enables us to do that. His light enables us to do it. Verses 9 and 10. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Reading, very familiar verse, Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I love the description of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are wonderful things. I mean, they, they, they truly, truly are. But 
the next, the next verse there, the next sentence is what? Against these, there is no law. There is no law. I, there's no law against loving. That's what he's saying. There's no law against love. There just isn't. And, and we have crucified the flesh, which goes back to what? Putting away the old man. Putting the old, way, old man. And in Romans, Paul said, in other words, not even give him a consideration. Not even giving the old man the time of day, right? Not even. And then finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. How do you find out what's acceptable to the Lord? If we live in the Spirit... We will also walk in the Spirit. This is how we find out what is acceptable in the Lord. Verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, which is the flesh, which is the world, which is the wicked one. Those are our three adversaries, right? The enemy, the world, and our flesh. And those works are wicked. They're, those are dark works. Who had Second Corinthians? Well, hang on. We are the people of God. I'm say this again. We are the people of God, and the world is not our friend. The world is not our friend. Second Corinthians six fourteen through eighteen. The really bad guy. Amen. I mean, what fellowship is righteousness with all is? Or light with darkness? You know what? They have nothing in common. We no longer through our relationship with Christ and our identity of Christ really have nothing in common with the world anymore. It's just not there. And nor should it be. Nor should it be. It says, he says, I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's who we are. Sons and daughters of God. Not, not of what? Not of, we're not sons of perdition anymore. We're not sons of perdition anymore. And it says, but rather expose them. And this is, this is interesting. And translated, it actually means to reprove or expose or to convict. And it sounds like the work of the Holy Spirit to me. Who's the reprover? The Holy Spirit. Who's the exposer? The Holy Spirit. Who's the convictor? Holy Spirit. So when we are to expose works of darkness, make sure it is the Holy Spirit when we feel compelled to reprove, expose, or convict. Make sure it's the Holy Spirit, not our opinions, not our judgment, not our personal thoughts. It needs to be God. God is, God is the exposer. He's a reprover and he's a convictor. And he will use you to do that. But make sure it's him doing that. Okay. And by the way, when that happens, we're we can do it because it's God. And then verse 12. For it is even shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. <clears throat> I thought about this, uh, this particular verse and... And really the thing that, that came to my mind is like we often, we often say that 
all sin is the same to God. And I don't believe that's true at all. I don't believe that's true at all. I know that Jesus paid the price for all sin. And I know death, those two I know. But do not think for a moment that, that some sins are not more grievous than others because some are more grievous. Some are more grievous. There's, there's, there's a darkness. There's a darkness beyond darkness. I mean, there really is. It says, we, not shameful even to speak of those things, to even think of those things that are done in the dark. And you're not, not talking about the, the works of the flesh that Paul spells out. It's darker than that. That, the nature of man, the sinful nature, it is darker than that. There is sin. There is sin and the depth of sin that should shake us, should shake us to our core. I mean, really just rattle us. I'm, I'm bringing some up here. Abortion should shake us. It should shake us. Th this is the bane of the United States. God is judging the United States for this dreadful and heinous sin of genocide. Matthew 2.18. Rama. Lamentation, weeping and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Because they are no more. And, you know, we can go, go down the list of these. I just, it's, it's terrible. Pedophilia, sexual trafficking, domestic abuse at levels we can't even comprehend. Depraved violence. Depraved violence. These are wicked. These are wicked. The depth of spiritual depravity is beyond our comprehension. Is beyond our comprehension. It's deeper than we could possibly know. And by the way, this would include our own hearts. There is a depth to darkness in you you can't even fathom. We can't. That's why in Jeremiah says, 6, 9 says, the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But what's the last four words he says? Who can know it? Know it. You know, and, and I say this, and I say this with all seriousness. I, I don't have to look any further than the mirror to see the wickedness of man. Not any further than that. And when I think about these sins that are more grievous, that are just more grievous, it is always the most vulnerable and innocent that take the brunt of this wickedness. It's always those that cannot defend themselves. The, the, the kids in Ukraine, you know, schools being bombed, hospitals, the, the child that gets molested, the unborn, they cannot defend themselves. How do you think God feels about this? Really? How do you think God feels about this? Psalm 10, 17 and 18. Who had that? Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their hearts. You will cause your ear to hear. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. That the man of the earth may oppress the man. You know, that's how God thinks about it. He's going to shut it down. He's going to shut it down. He, he, he is grieved and he is angry. He is grieved and he is angry. And we should, again, we should never think that some things don't matter to God more than others. The abuse of the innocent matters to God. It really does. You know, we, we have this song we sing for this purpose. And he, he goes, give me a heart that hurts like yours. Give me a heart that hurts like yours. Verse 13. But are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. But all things are exposed. The light does it. Exposed, we already talked about this, reprove, convict. But manifest is to make it obvious and evident. In other words, it's going to be exposed. There's going to be conviction. It'll be evident and obvious. Who had John 6, 7 through 11? Is that John 6, 7 through 11? Mm -hmm. 
Really? I'm going to read it. I'm going to give you the wrong scripture. Let me, let me read what I have, okay? Nevertheless, this is uh, Jesus talking. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. It's probably 16 it is. It's John 16, my bad. So I'll continue anyways. Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment of sin, because they do not believe in me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged." The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that reproves, convicts, and makes everything evident, and all things will be revealed. All things will be revealed. And this is true for the unbeliever and the believer alike. It is true for everybody. This is what the Holy Spirit does. For whatever makes manifest is light. Who it, did it, anybody have First John 1, 5 through 7? Okay, I'll get that. This is a message which you have heard from him and, I de- and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We really have read this before, but this is the truth. Whatever man is light, and that is God. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And we, his people, are to be the reflection, the manifestation of this light. We're to be that. Just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, we are to reflect the light of his sun. We should be a reflection, a light that shines. It shines right? Therefore, and then verse 14, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ, so therefore he says, therefore he says, obviously he says is God, right? He's saying this, and I call this a wake-up call. Why? Awake you who sleep and arise from the dead. This is a wake-up call. To whom is this intended? In this case, there are actually a few thoughts on this. Some actually think it's about believers, but I, I don't. I think it's about the unbeliever. The reason why is believers aren't dead. We may get sleepy, but we're not dead. The world is dead. Unbelievers are dead. We are not dead, right? So death, it can mean the same thing. To sleep and, to, and death can mean the same thing. So I believe that God is actually appealing, appealing to the non-believer, just as he appealed to you, just as he reached out to you. Because God is always the initiator of any relationship with himself. Because there are none that seek after God, no, not one. None that seek after God. So he's appealing here to the, to the non-believer. And then he says, awake you who sleep. And I call this the uh, salvation clock. The salvation, awake you who sleep. The alarm is going off. It's going off. It's time. And don't hit that snooze button, right? Don't hit the snooze button. Because today, today is the day of salvation. Second Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Here it is. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God arm is not so short that he cannot save and it's by his he reached us and he reaches a dying world this is how he's chosen to do it and he says arise from the dead and that means we need to go from spiritual death to spiritual life christ rose from the dead and so can you non-believer so can you non-believer saints so have you as christ has risen from the dead we're baptized into his resurrection. We have risen literally from the dead. We were dead in our trespasses. Christ's resurrection is the And Christ will give you light. Finish with this. And Christ will give you light. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and nothing was made that was made. And without him, I'm sorry, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. This is the key verse. In him was life and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. Not comprehended. And nothing has changed. The darkness can't comprehend the light. The darkness cannot comprehend the things of God. The carnal mind cannot discern the spiritual things of God. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They cannot. But the light of Christ means light, life for every man. It's the light of Jesus that has given us light. That thing that's inside us right now is literally the light of God, and he's given us all life. So as we wrap up this evening, walking in the light, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. It is his light that we are to walk in. And, and by the way, this light, this light should illuminate, illuminate everything we do and every circumstance we encounter. That light should illuminate everything, it should make it. Whenever you walk into that room, it could be the church, it could be Wheezy's. I don't care where you're walking into. You know what? Wherever you go, we're bringing Jesus. Every, wherever you go, you're taking Jesus with you. And this is the light that shines. You walk into the store. Man, that act of kindness you give to anybody. For me in Austin's, it's just putting shopping carts back. This just bugs the heck out of me when I see shopping carts everywhere. But you know it's those little things that, that do matter. They matter to God. They should matter to you too. As you're laughing, it is a pet peeve of yeah, yeah. I'll grab a couple, three, and put them up. I am not kidding. I'm not trying. But uh, no, think about it. Wherever you go, you know, like whether it's coming into church, the restaurant you go into, you go into a store, your workplace, your workplace, right? And especially your homes. Where, think about it, you know, especially, you know, ma- the marrieds, right? Man, you can have conflict and stuff like that. It happens, right? It happens. But yeah, you, you step into that room. Remember when you walk in there. Whenever you walk into that room, you're taking Jesus with you. Let him do the talk. Let his, his light shine through us. Matthew five fourteen through 16. You, us, saints, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, that's old song. No, right? But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. It's true. Everywhere we go, we have the light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As, uh, as we looked earlier and we, we looked at grievous sin, things that are difficult even to discuss, to think about, things we just appalling to us, right? And, you know, as children of light, it's, it's going to happen to every single one of us. We're going to be called to take a stand. You're going to be called. If you haven't already, it's certainly going to happen. It's impossible not to happen. You're a child of light. It happens. We're going to be called to take a stand. A very, very famous quote. The, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Someday, we're going to have to take a stand. And it could be when you walk out this door. It could be tomorrow. But you will have to take a stand for God and for righteousness because you will be confronted by evil. We're to rebuke it. We're to convict it. We are called to do that. So again, that time, we'll all need to do something to confront evil. But remember, we never do this on our own and never in our own strength, right? We can't because then it wouldn't be God. It needs to be God. When that day and that appointment, when that thing happens where you need to take that stand, 
He is with you. He's in it. And he what? Calls you to do it. And for you to do it is an act of loving obedience to take that stand at that particular point in time. But God will always. So next week we'll be looking at Ephesians 5, 13 through 21, and we're going to be walking through wisdom. Actually, next week I won't be here. Uh, so you probably get the Bible answer man again. I don't know whatever my mind opposes it. Hopefully, Lord willing, he's healthy at that time. So, hey, I wanted to open this up. though. You guys got any commentary, anything you want to add to the, the conversation since I've babbled all night and everything? So God give you guys something. We'd love to hear it if he has. If not, then we're going to pray and do one more song. Going once, going twice, three times. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word, for truth. We thank you for your light, which has given us life. And now you've called us to walk in this light that, you know what? Wherever we go, whatever we do, people would know that we belong to you, that our lights would shine before men, and that they would know that you're God. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it's starting. All right, let's let's stand. You guys have a good week in the Lord. Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday. All right. All right.